Hello everyone, welcome to the Alexander Robinson Movie News Show. We are at episode 4 for June 5th, 2016. The first show of June, yay! And because it's June, you know that it, we are officially now in the realm of summer. And let me tell you something, And people who live in LA, you can identify with me on this. When you live in LA, you know that for the past four summers, it's been hot as balls. We have had, we have been going through a heat wave, a drought, whatever you want to call it. And I remember the first time, like, the drought officially caught my eye was uh, back in 2012. Uh, because, like, every summer since 2012 has been hot as shit. Uh, and I was doing summer school at UC Santa Cruz, which actually was the place where this whole YouTube channel started. So you can thank. Uh, the banana slugs for that. But anyway, I remember um, leaving summer school uh, um, in June, no, August of 2012 to go back to LA. And I look at the weather as I'm heading back and I'm like, oh no, no, I am not ready to go back. Because, like, if you've been to Santa Cruz, um, okay, if you don't, if you haven't been to Santa Cruz, it's right near the beach. The weather is very. It's kind of like what L.A. weather is described to outsiders. I mean, sometimes it can be really cold, but during the day, like on a warm day, it's not too hot. You're right next to the ocean, so you get that awesome ocean breeze. But everything else is um, its just really nice all around. But summers in L.A. have just been utter hell. It, they're, they're so bad, sometimes I wish that I would live back in Texas just because... Um, I mean, it's all sweaty and sticky over there uh, and humid, uh, but at the very least, you have some sort of moisture. But then every time I go to Texas in the summer, I feel the humidity and I go, no, LA is actually much better. We might be in a drought here in California, but LA is starting to sound a lot better. I don't know. I just go um, between dry and hum humid. I don't know what's worse, <laughs> to be honest. But anyway, that's all I want to say because we are not talking about um, what the weather is like in Los Angeles. We are talking about movie news. What's going on in the world of movies? Now, last week I did my show on Memorial Day. The reason for that is because I uh, had to work at last minute on Sunday. But now I'm back. I'm back, the show's back on a Sunday, and there was something that, actually, there was a bit of news that came out on Monday as I was recording that I missed, and we're going to jump into that right now, and unfortunately, the first few stories, it's going to be a little negative, so just, just hang in there, everyone. We'll get to some good stuff, but let's talk Ghostbusters. Huh? Everyone, I, I'm, I mean, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but... I am sick of talking about this new Ghostbusters movie because I just – honestly, I hate all the negativity of it. I want it to be good, but the trailers don't make it to look good at all, which apparently is something that Dan Aykroyd disagrees with. Um, this story comes from SlashFilm.com, and it was – oh, no, this was actually reported on Tuesday – um, so I just missed it, uh, but it says, Dan Aykroyd praises the new Ghostbusters as Melissa McCarthy responds to backlash. Okay, before, okay, here's what the article says. We're just a month and a half away from seeing if director Paul Faye can deliver an entertaining reboot of the classic Ghostbusters. Many have already written off the film, while others are holding out hope that the film is much better than the early trailers have indicated. I'm a member of the latter, even though I'm very skeptical. From my perspective, the perspective of the person who's writing the article, which is um, Ethan Anderton, giving credit to this guy, the broad style of comedy is a little worrisome, but the film also has a lot of style and cool visuals, but I'm still hoping for the best. Now that hope has been bolstered somewhat, thanks to original Ghostbusters creator and star Dan Aykroyd, taking the time to praise the film following a test screening. In fact, he even says that it one-ups the original in some regards. And here's what Dan Aykroyd said. I'm just going to skip to what he said. As originator of the original, saw test screening of new movie. Apart from brilliant, genuine performances from the cast, both female and male, it has more laughs and more scares than the first two films. Plus, Bill Murray is in it. 
As one of millions of man fans and Ray stands, I'm paying to see that and bringing all my friends. Now let's continue with what the article says. Some people are assuming that more laughs and more scares means that Aykroyd is saying the reboot is better than the original, but the movie can have more jokes and scarier ghosts without the film being better overall. Even though the original Ghostbusters was a sci-fi comedy, this reboot certainly looks like they're hitting the comedy buttons a little harder, which could end up being part of the problem. Here's my opinion on this whole thing. Yes, Ghostbusters is horror comedy. It is more towards comedy, but I remember the first time I saw Ghostbusters, there were some things that downright freaked the shit out of me. Like, okay, I didn't see all of Ghostbusters originally. The, so the very first image I ever got of Ghostbusters was Slimer coming out of the hot dog stand once all the ghosts are loose. Like, it's at, say, at the beginning of the third act of the film. And that image really just scared me. Uh, for, I know it's like a goofy looking green ghost, but it just looked, it was an ugly little spud. And it just horrified me. I was like, oh my god, what is that thing? And then years later, I actually saw the whole movie. And I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Uh, um, so, I mean, Ghostbusters definitely helps by having a handful of scares. Uh, um, because... I think it makes the comedy moments that much better. When you play a movie straight, that's a comedy, uh, the laughs, for me at least, I'm speaking for myself, the laughs seem to work better w rather than when you're just playing for straight-up goofball comedy. That's not to say all straight-up goofball comedies are bad. It's just with goofball comedies, sometimes you have the problem of them forcing the comedy, so you're not going to get genuine laughs out of it. And as for Dan Aykroyd's comments here, uh, you know, I'd like to believe him because, I mean, he is the guy who helped create Ghostbusters along with Harold Ramis, rest in peace, because the two of them wrote the script, and he's one of the main actors in the original movie who plays um, Ray Stans. But Dan Aykroyd, after a while, like today, he seems to be a little... A little crazy, let's just say that. I mean, I have mad respect for the guy because of Ghostbusters. Uh, but, I mean, he kind of is a little crazy today. And the fact that he's an executive producer for this movie. I mean, he's basically trying to sell the movie. Uh, whether or not he actually enjoyed the movie is not really something I can say. Because I didn't see the movie yet and it is his opinion so he can think whatever he wants now let's go to um the second part of this headline which said melissa mccarthy responds to backlash uh, um and this will actually segue into another ghostbusters story that i really i kind of don't want to talk about but anyway um this again is the same slash film article Meanwhile, Melissa McCarthy was recently asked by The Guardian how she feels about the backlash against the movie. Here's what the actress had to say. Quote, All those comments? You're ruining my childhood? I mean, really? Four women doing any movie on Earth will destroy your childhood? I have a visual of those people not having a Ben, which is McCarthy's husband, not having friends. So they're just sitting there and spewing hate into this fake world of the internet. I just hope they find a friend. Which, okay... First of all, she's right in one sense of the um, you're ruining my childhood comment because I despise that uh, criticism whenever I see something um, that's based on a beloved property that has millions of fans. I hate the term you're ruining my childhood because look, okay, let's let's take Godzilla for example since I'm an expert in Godzilla. The Roland Emmerich movie, yeah? Is an abomination, no question about that. Huh? But don't go saying that the movie ruined your childhood if you are a longtime Godzilla fan, because it's not going to ruin your perception of the original movies. The original 1954 movie is still going to be a classic, and you're still going to love all the other Godzilla movies you watched that were made by Toho. Same thing with Ghostbusters right here. If this new Ghostbusters sucks, you still have the original to enjoy. It's not going to ruin your enjoyment of the original Ghostbusters. If anything, if this movie ends up being bad, you'll have more appreciation for the original Ghostbusters because of how brilliant it was and how just so perfectly made it was. But what I don't like 
is the way that Melissa McCarthy is saying that these people have no loved ones, no friends, that they're just lonely. That They're basically just like internet haters, which really, when you're trying to promote a movie, the last thing you ever want to do is criticize the fans you're trying to win over because this movie is in hot enough water already. The last thing we need is the cast and the director calling all the fans assholes or losers. So, and speaking of that, let's go into um, this next one right here. This comes from CNN.com, and it's another um, someone else lashing out against the Ghostbusters criticism. Um, okay, here we go. Um, Judd Apatow thinks haters of new Ghostbusters are Trump supporters. That's the goddamn headline right there. Huh? Um, and here's what the article says. Director Judd Apatow has an interesting theory about those who have been hating on Ghostbusters uh, with an all-female cast. In an interview with the news and culture website Uproarks, U-P-R-O-X-X, Apatow says he believes there may have been a common demographic between those who take an issue with the new film and those who are supporting a certain presidential candidate. Here's what he says, quote, I would assume there's a very large crossover of people who are doubtful Ghostbusters will be great and people excited about the Donald Trump candidacy. I would assume they are the exact same people, close quote. The project has been the subject of criticism almost since it was first announced. Critics have taken umbrage with everything from remaking the original, which is considered a classic, with a female cast, to the fact that star Leslie Jones, the only African-American lead actress in the film, portrays the only Ghostbuster who's not a scientist. Apatow praises the movie as being made by the great Paul Feig and stars the funniest people on earth. He says he believes too much attention is being given to just some angry trolls and predicts the new Ghostbusters will go over well. The movie comes out and it'll be great, and people will be happy to have it. It's not like anybody really cares about a couple of idiots who hold onto the idea that things never evolve. Okay. Okay, ugh. Um, Judd Apatow is someone I really admire. I think, uh... The man, in terms of his career, has had a few hits or misses. I mean, he produced Freaks and Geeks, which is a really great show. Uh, he made 40-Year-Old Virgin, Knocked Up, Trainwreck, which I really love. I really like all those movies, especially 40-Year-Old Virgin. And he's produced um, quite a handful of stuff that I liked, uh, most notably Forgetting Sarah Marshall and Superbad. So... And I've actually seen Judd Apatow do stand-up at the comedy store here in Hollywood, and he's really funny. He is a really funny man. But, again, like with the Melissa McCarthy thing, this is not the road you want to take. And also, it should be noted that in the CNN article, um, it says that Apatow is a producer on Ghostbusters, which I didn't even know that. Oh, hang on, I'm going to go to IMDb. Let's see... So, while I look this up, I will say, again, if you want to win over the people who are, like, the fan base of the original movie and who aren't showing faith in it, then the last thing you want to do is really criticize them. Okay, let's see here. Okay, full cast and crew. Um... Okay, IMDb. IMDb is actually not listing Judd Apatow as um, as a producer on Ghostbusters. So maybe that's something CNN got wrong. It's always good to um, like fact check before you write things or before you do shows. Okay, that that was on the Ghostbusters IMDb page. Let me go to Judd Apatow's IMDb page. Um. No, he's not listed as producer, so that's a screw-up. That goes to show you, folks. Fact-check your work before you um, actually report on it. Those are the mostly negative things I have to say in terms of news. Those are the most negative news stories that I have. The next news story that I have is actually a little uh, disappointing. But before we do that, if you really love what I'm doing on this channel, whether it's movie reviews, let's plays, or podcasts, then you can go over to patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson and 
help support the channel. What you can do there is you can donate a monthly fee or a fee for any video I put out. But you can also set a cap on how much you want to spend a month. And if you do, you'll get rewards outside of supporting the channel. You also might get rewards like early access to retro reviews and Let's Plays. You get to see them a day early before the non-Patreons get to see them. Or, I don't know, Google Hangouts in the future? Like, private Google Hangouts? I'm still working on the rewards, but again, if you love what I'm doing, you can go to patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson. Go donate and help this channel grow. If you don't, hey, that's no problem. You're still getting awesome content. So again, patreon.com slash therealmrrobinson. Now that I got done promoting that, let's get into some disappointing news, which is especially disappointing if you're a Godzilla fan like me. So, about the time the second trailer for Godzilla Resurgence popped up, or the actual official trailer, there was word that um, who was going to distribute the movie in the United States? Because Obviously, for being another Toho Godzilla movie, it wasn't going to be released theatrically in the U.S., especially since Godzilla 2000, the last Toho Godzilla movie to be released in the United States theatrically, bombed. So, about the time the second trailer came out, or the first official trailer, uh, this company called New World Cinema is um, handling distribution, and they even put up a Facebook post saying... Quote, to all Godzilla fans, we are working hard to bring Godzilla to every state. Patience, my friends. She is coming. Okay, a little off considering that nobody really distinguishes Godzilla as a she. Um, so it was a little weird, but again, for Godzilla fans, it was exciting. Well, I'm here to crush your dreams. Don't worry, don't worry out there because my dreams are crushed too. When I heard that New World Cinemas is actually not distributing Godzilla Resurgence. So this source actually comes from Gormaru Island, which is actually more of a... It's a Facebook group uh, that really does, like, really great um, reports on Godzilla stories or anything involving Japanese giant monsters. So it's a Facebook page I definitely check out. They're very sourceful. But today, as I'm recording it, they just reported that there was some confusion over at New World Cinema. And here's what New World Cinema had to say about um, the Godzilla Resurgence thing. Hi guys, we want to clear something up for you as it is causing a lot of speculation. New World Cinemas are not the distributors for the new Godzilla film. The mistake was make, and I'm reading this as it's typed out, huh? because we said Godzilla coming soon. This was merely a post to promote Godzilla as we too are big fans. We apologize for any confusion regarding this film. The original post has been edited so it cannot cause any more misunderstandings. We accept that due to being busy in cans and preparing for our first annual Fright Fest film festival by NYC IFF, we have neglected to notice the buzz on our Facebook page. However, our admin team are back on track and will bring you all the latest news about New World Cinemas. We wish you all an amazing weekend. Now, I didn't say our admin team is back. I said admin team are back. Again, this is the way they spell this out. Okay, so let me talk to New World Cinema straight on. I doubt they're listening to me, but if you are, if anyone out there at New World Cinema is listening... Think before you post shit, okay? So you as an entire company with everyone who works there was too busy for three weeks to realize, uh-oh, we screwed up by saying we're working on getting Godzilla to every state in the country when you're not even distributing the damn movie? That's That does not look good on you. Whoever, whoever was the person who decided that post was okay to put up on Facebook, whether it was an intern or somebody higher up, you should have been fired for that because that really, I mean, outside of pissing off a lot of Godzilla fans and getting their hopes up, that does not look good for you as a company. That is like a major screw up, especially when you're a company that distributes movies. That does not look good on you. 
Okay, so there's that. Um, um, now the big question is, who distributes Godzilla Resurgence in the United States? Because we're in the year 2016, uh, and the internet is more popular than it ever has been in 2004, which was when the last Godzilla movie came out. The last real Godzilla movie, Godzilla Final Wars. Uh, you can't, like, wait this long uh, to bring Godzilla to the United States, uh, because, I mean, James Rolfe said this best when he talked about Godzilla Resurgence. The people who want to see this movie, like me, we're going to see it. We are going to see it even if it means downloading it illegally off the internet uh, and hoping that the movie has English subtitles because it's going to get bootlegged to hell when this movie gets released. Um, I mean, when it gets released on DVD and Blu-ray in Japan, uh, People are going to get a hold of it. People are going to make um, unauthorized bootleg copies of it to sell on the internet. you got to distribute this thing to the U.S. quickly. Now, I understand that Godzilla Resurgence, its chances of being released theatrically in the U.S. are slim to nothing. Like, chances are it's not going to get an actual theatrical release. Unless, of course, as I proposed in my Godzilla Resurgence trailer review... The American Cinematheque did one of their giant movie monster events, and like the grand finale to finish off the uh, marathon was Godzilla Resurgence, which I really hope you do. If somebody at the American Cinematheque is listening to me, please um, try to work out a deal with Toho to show Godzilla Resurgence at your theater. When you guys showed Godzilla Final Wars there uh, back in 2005, or hell, any other time you've done a giant monster movie marathon, it's been a hit. I was there when the American Cinematheque Egyptian Theater showed Godzilla Final Wars, and it was an unforgettable experience. So please, like any way that this movie can be legally shown in the United States or that I can legally see it in the United States would be great, especially if it was in this year. So... That's really disappointing. Um, we'll see how this story develops because I got I to gotta get my fix on Godzilla Resurgence. Like, I really have to see this movie. Huh? Like, there are two movies coming out this year that have the word Resurgence in it. And I'd rather see the Godzilla Resurgence more than the Independence Day Resurgence. I don't know why I decided to put the at the beginning of each movie title, but whatever. Ugh, okay, that rant makes me want to drink. Ah, especially since we're in a drought and it's June, it's best to stay hydrated. Let's move on to something more upbeat. Let's move on to something that I hope, 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 hope happens. Um, let's go to the realm of Marvel. Let's go to what's going on in the world of Marvel. We have the first front runner up for Captain Marvel which will be Marvel's first female-led superhero movie. And it looks like we're looking at Academy Award winner Brie Larson to play the role, which Captain Marvel... Before I get into the article, Captain Marvel was a character that... Um, one, I'm not familiar with at all. I know that right now it's Carol Danvers who was Miss Marvel at one point. And I just never knew what actress should play... Um, Miss Marvel, or Captain Marvel, I apologize. Uh, Charlize Theron's name has been thrown around a lot, which that was kind of my go-to answer. Um, Ronda Rousey's name has been thrown out there, mainly by Ronda herself, which, I'm sorry, I like Ronda Rousey, but she can't act to save her life, and nobody wants to see uh, her play Captain Marvel. You know what, I actually take that back. One person does want to see Ronda Rousey play Captain Marvel, and it's Ronda Rousey. But uh, I never thought of Brie Larson to play Captain Marvel. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, why not? Huh? But here, anyway, let's get into the story. Um, this comes from Variety.com. And the headline is, Brie Larson, the frontrunner to play Captain Marvel. Exclusive. After winning the Best Actress Oscar for the... Room, room, I'm sorry, not the room. Uh, Brie Larson has her sights on another marvelous role. 
Sources tell Variety Larson is in early talks to play Captain Marvel, one of Marvel's most popular female superheroes. It's unknown where negotiations stand, but sources have told Variety that Larson is their first choice and that she is leaning towards playing the part. Marvel has no comment on the story. No director is currently on board. Marvel, however, has always planned to have an actress lined up early with the idea of possibly introducing her in one of its upcoming films before Captain Marvel, just like what they did with Black Panther. Black Panther uh, was in Captain America Civil War before casting for the solo movie or even hiring of a director for the solo movie has even been announced. Inside Out scribe Meg... Lefebvre and Nicole Perlman are currently writing the script. Nicole Perlman co-wrote the screenplay of Guardians of the Galaxy with James Gunn, which follows Carol Danvers, an Air Force pilot whose DNA is fused with that of an alien during an accident. The resulting alteration gives her the superpowers of strength, energy projection, and flight. Ken Feige is producing the movie. Larson has been choosing both big-budget spectacles like the upcoming Kong Skull Island and prestige films such as Room and The Glass Castle, which she is currently filming. She can be seen next in Ben Whitley's Free Fire opposite Army Hammer. So, I'm on board for Brie Larson as Captain Marvel. I think without having much knowledge of the character through the comics, I think Brie Larson is a really terrific actress. Um, I mean, obviously, many people now know her from Room because she won a goddamn Oscar for it. But before that, she was Amy Schumer's sister in Trainwreck. Um, and then she was... She was also Abed's girlfriend in um, a few episodes of Community, which is really a great show. If you have never seen Community, go watch it. Um, but it's, it's canceled now, but go w watch the DVDs. But Brie Larson, I think, is a really good choice. I, I would really, well, I mean, I would pay to see Captain Marvel anyway. I'm going to pay to see it anyway when it comes out. But I would just pay to see her um, take on the role. Now, um, before we move on with the news, there's actually a um, video that goes in line with um, Brie Larson and Captain Marvel. Which, this comes from um, io9.gizmodo.com, which is pretty much um, Brie Larson's on a press tour for Room. So this was even before they considered Brie Larson for the role. This was last year. Uh, but basically, it's a small 44-second uh, clip of her reaction on, um, like, playing Captain Marvel. And, um, well... I think the clip will speak for itself. Huh? A lot of fans want you to play Captain Marvel when... Uh, to play, isn't that a boy? Uh, it's supposed to be the first female-led uh, The Marvel first movie. female? Yeah, I mean... So would, would you... I be playing a man? No, a woman. <laughs> <Captain> <laughs> oh, I was like, this is interesting. <laughs> I'm kind of into it. I thought I was always forever going to be stuck playing female roles, but I'm down to play Chris Evans. <laughs> Oh wait, no, Chris Evans is Captain America. Who's Captain Marvel? I have no idea what I'm talking about. Great. <laughs> but people want me to play this. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. I'm glad. I guess I gotta start reading the comic book. Okay, that's pretty much it. It's just adorable, I think. Um, I mean, I'm in love with Brie Larson, but um, yeah, I'm down with her being Captain Marvel. Um, so let's move on. You know what? Actually... Before we move on to the next bit of news, no, that's not what I want to pull up. There we go. Okay, before we move on to the next bit of news, I want to do a shout out huh? um, for a new podcast that I'm not in, but I'm currently listening to and I think is definitely underappreciated. Uh, um, I recently have been listening to W-I-W-L-N, which translates to What I Watched Last Night. Uh, this is a movie podcast that comes from the Awkward Human Network. And basically, it's three friends who sit around and talk about um, movies they watched last night. They get into certain topics. It's a really great um, podcast, I gotta say. like It feels very natural. The hosts all have great chemistry with each other, which when you do a podcast with um, other people, that's one of the things that I really 
think is a success. You got to have great chemistry with the people you're doing with because if you don't get along with the people you're doing the show with or you just can't find anything to click with when doing a show with them, then it's a bust. Unless, of course, you don't get along with the other hosts and you end up fighting, then in that case, it's greatly entertaining. But these three hosts definitely nail it. Um, again, it's what I watched last night. You can go to iTunes, um, go check it out. I haven't told them that I'm doing um, a promotion for their show. So definitely, if you... And the only reason I'm doing this is because it's a really great podcast that I think deserves much more attention than it's getting right now. So go over to awkwardhuman.com or iTunes, go check out what I watched last night podcast and let them know that Alex, the real Mr. Robinson sent you. And trust me, you will not regret listening to this show. So let's move on to the next bit of news, which is something that I think probably the biggest news story this week, or if not the biggest news story, then at least the most developed news story, which is the Rogue One reshoots. Now, let's start off with um, how this started. Originally, uh, Rogue One, there was a rumor going on from the gossip website called Page Six that said their sources claimed that Disney is unhappy with uh, the first cut of Rogue One and it's going through expensive reshoots. And at that point, everyone flipped the fuck out like people were worried oh my god rogue one is gonna be bad it's gonna not be a good movie oh my god sound the death star battle alarm it's not gonna be good ah okay okay hold yeah hold on hold on hold on hold on so days go by and the first sign that this story was bullshit was that it was coming from page six which is technically a gossip website and not very reliable at that, especially when it comes to stories like this. Now, if it had come from The Hollywood Reporter or Variety, then we'd have a different song and dance right there. But no, it came from a gossip news site. And as the days go on, like the whole thing of Disney being worried was proven to be bullshit. Uh, uh, the reshoots were going like in to lighten up the movie, which similar reports happened with... Um, with uh, Suicide Squad. There you go. And um, so now Entertainment Weekly has put an article up here uh, basically listing the facts of what's true and what's false about the reshoots for Rogue One, a Star Wars story. So um, I'm not going to read the entire article, but I'm just going to cut straight to um, what, like, what's really going on. First of all... Um, the current timeline, uh, it says here, the plan now is to lock picture in mid-August and begin scoring the movie in September, which would actually be an earlier timeline than The Force Awakens, which also underwent several weeks of summer reshoots and locked picture in October. The rumor that almost half the movie is being reshot brings in both laughter and groans from those closest to the film. Uh, while it might seem like spin control for... From those working on the film, their logic bears out, if we were rewriting the movie and reshooting 40% of the movie, we would not be finished in August, a source from the production says. People really would be panicking and changing the release date. So basically, if that all was true, all you would hear at Disney and Lucasfilm is this. So that's one aspect of the reshoots. The next aspect is a new collaborator. Rumors that Christopher McQuarren, best known for writing the Oscar-winning script for The Usual Suspects and writing and directing Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, has written a new script and will be involved in co-directing the reshoots. That's bullshit right there. McQuarren did make contributions to an earlier draft of the script, sources confirm, but that's the extent of his work on Rogue One. As rumors about his involvement in the Star Wars film began to spread yesterday, McQuarren himself took to Twitter to deny them. And here's what he said on Twitter. Attention bloggers, I'm reading some horseshit rumors tonight. You know where to find me. Do your jobs. Hey, I gotta respect him for being very simple and straightforward. So there's that. Next up, let's talk about the grittier tone. 
Fears that the heavy-duty war movie is being watered down into a light-hearted caper are unfounded, according to what EW has learned. The movie is very different than The Force Awakens, and that's intentional, one source says. It's a war film. Rumors that Disney executives have forced the changes to make the movie more family-friendly are also false. According to EW sources, there have been no test screenings, and it's unlikely there ever will be on a Star Wars film. Which, when you, again, going back to what Page Six reported, how the hell do you get a cut of the movie that's ready to go in front of test audiences in May when your movie's being released in December? That doesn't really add up, especially on a movie on a grand scale like Star Wars. Something's a little fishy when you say that. So anyway, that's all that's being said about the reshoots for Rogue One. All movies go through reshoots. And it doesn't mean that the movie's in trouble. It just means that there's something that they missed or they think they can do better. So they're going back into doing reshoots. I think Rogue One is going to be a really good movie. Maybe not as great as The Force Awakens or Empire Strikes Back or any of the original trilogy. But, um, I mean, it'll definitely be better than the prequels. Like, it, I, I would be shocked if any movie that Disney made with the Star Wars name on it is worse than what the prequels had to offer because that is actually a major accomplishment to make a Star Wars movie that's worse than episodes 1, 2, and 3. So Rogue One's going to be fine. I'm looking forward to it. But um, it, again, like with all giant movies, it is best to hold your expectations because you could easily get disappointed. Huh? Um, wow, this is actually turning... I'm just looking at the time. This is the longest show I've recorded so far, at least in this podcast. So let's move on to the final bit of news before we get into the Blu-ray releases. And this actually will kind of segue into the Blu-ray releases. But first, let me take a drink of water. Because I've been talking too much and I need to stay hydrated. But this comes from Collider.com, which is basically... The first trailer and details on the ultimate edition of Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. So, you people out there, if you've been following me for a while, or if you've seen my review for Batman vs. Superman, you know damn well what I think of the movie. I don't think it's very good. I think it's actually terrible. But um, people have been wondering about this extended Ultimate Edition that's R-rated. We at Collider are happy to exclusively premiere the trailer for the extended Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice Ultimate Edition, along with details on Blu-ray and digital HD releases of director Zack Snyder's superhero Smackdown. The Ultimate Edition, which features 30 minutes of new footage incorporated into an extended R-rated cut of the film, will be available early on digital HD on June 28th, with the theatrical version of the movie, and both will be available to purchase on Blu-ray combo pack, DVD, and Ultraviolet HD on July 19th. So, here, so a lot of people with this extended cut of Batman vs. Superman are saying to themselves, okay, this is the movie, this is gonna be really good. Any people who hated Batman vs. Superman, you're gonna dig the Ultimate Edition because it fixes all the problems that were done. Um, I talked about this on a show um, a couple episodes back. I think it was maybe the first one. Yeah, it was the first episode. Um, of the Alexander Robinson movie news show, where I talked about that deleted scene um, that Warner Brothers released soon after Batman vs. Superman hits theaters. And um, Stephen Merced from Geek Down Nation said that that scene actually helped make a lot of sense with Lex Luthor's plan. But he knows comic books. Stephen is, like, really deep into comic books, more than me. So, as someone who's an outsider, who's just a general audience member, I looked at that deleted scene and went, What the fuck did that even mean? I didn't get it. Huh? And that's what I'm kind of worried with Batman vs. Superman, because there's still going to be a lot of stuff in here that even if they add more and explain things more, it's still probably going to be confusing. And plus, I was, I've said this, the idea of an R-rated... Um, Okay, an R-rated Batman movie, you could get away with. Huh? But an R-rated Superman movie? No! No, no, no! That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Huh? 
Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just being bitter, but I don't. From the looks of this movie, there's nothing about it that warrants an R rating. And from what the trailer said, it's rated R for like strong violence, which, I mean, I don't know. I, I, okay, you know what? I would like to say I'll watch it just to see if it's worthy of the R rating because I doubt it is. But a couple days ago. Uh, the cinematographer for Batman vs. Superman, uh, Larry Fong, said something interesting about the extended cut. And he said this on Twitter, saying, quote, Those of you who are fans will dig it. If you hated it, you'll still hate it. So, I think I just saved my money right there. So, I mean, I always thought, like, this extended cut was never going to change anything. I Maybe maybe because I'm so negative on the movie, I was like, it's not going to make a difference. And the fact that the guy who actually shot the movie said that uh, uh, kind of really says a lot. But, okay, you know what? Let's do this. If you want me to see and review the Ultimate Edition of Batman vs. Superman uh, to see like what I think of the changes and whatnot, uh, um, just leave a comment down below, uh, like whether you... Th- would like to see a review or whether you think no just save your time you're probably not gonna like it so yeah just leave your comments down below and i'll take a look at them oh boy okay that does it for the news um okay you know what they uh before we get into blu-rays um let's actually i'm gonna actually go over quickly what the bonus features for the batman vs superman blu-ray listed are and they are as follows you know, uh, there's no detail on them. It's just names. Uh, uniting the world's finest. Gods and men. A meeting of giants. Uh, the warrior. The myth. The wonder. Accelerating design. The new Batmobile. Superman. Complexity and truth. Batman. Austerity and rage. Wonder Woman. Grace and power. Batcave. Legacy of the lair. The might and the power of a punch. Uh, the empire of Luther. And save the bats. Not exactly sure what save the bats is. Maybe it's, um something about actually saving the bats like save the whales i don't know i mean that's that that name for a bonus feature kind of makes me scratch my head but let's but enough about a blu-ray that's not going to come out until july let's get into the blu-rays that are coming out this week for those of you who are blu-ray nuts like me this week is a lot better than last week i gotta say yeah um oh my god i need another drink of water because i'm i am running my mouth here so, I think the biggest release coming out this week is Zootopia, which, okay, for Zootopia, you could go to my review on my channel. Basically, it's the story of young Judy Hopps, who wants to be a police officer in Zootopia. The problem is, there are no rabbit police officers, so she eventually finds her way into, like, some weird crime and has to team up with a fox, which foxes and rabbits are not the best of friends to try and solve the case and when i first saw this movie i said it's good but i don't think it's one of disney's best however upon like reconsidering it and thinking really thinking about it this is like really turning into disney's best because it really does tackle the idea of xenophobia racism and sexism but uses cartoon animals so it doesn't i mean okay maybe to some it's like banging you over the head with that message, but I think they do it pretty well to where, like, the adults will see it, but the kids will still enjoy it because it's animated and it's a cartoon. I mean, it's got some great jokes here. It's emotional. It's heartfelt. It's just a really great movie all around, and um, obviously it comes, like, in the regular Blu-ray set, which is Blu-ray, DVD, and digital copy, and then the Ultimate Collector's Edition, which is Blu-ray, Blu-ray 3D, DVD, and Digital HD, which... I guess say I think since not since Wreck It Ralph has Disney Animation Studios put out a 3D Blu-ray release because Wreck It Ralph was the last one. They didn't release Frozen on Blu-ray 3D. They didn't release Big Hero 6 on Blu-ray 3D. So hey, that's cool. Up next we have Michael Bay's 13 Hours: The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi, which is Michael Bay's take on the Benghazi situation, which I didn't see. You know, if you know me, you know I just 
I don't like Michael Bay at all. I think he's a hack. Um, but people have been saying that this is actually not too bad of a movie. Like, what the best thing I've heard about it is that it's got some really cool action. It's really stupid, but it doesn't try to have, like, a political agenda because it's so stupid. Like, you can't take it seriously. Um, but, I mean, well, I, I don't think I'll ever see this, but if you saw the movie or have interest in seeing it, then, hey, that's for you. I should probably address the elephant in the room about Michael Bay doing a, another Transformers movie that has a title and has a few cast members and a confirmed villain. The more I think to myself that there's no Transformers 5 being made, the more I feel like I'll do better in life, so... I'm just going to keep ignoring the fact that a Transformers 5 is coming out. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to see it. To me, it doesn't exist. All right, moving on. Let's go over to the Coen Brothers' Hail Caesar, which is basically, as I said, the Coen Brothers film, who have done stuff like The Big Lebowski, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?, No Country for Old Men, True Grit, to name a few. And this is basically their movie um, that takes place in the golden age of Hollywood, like back in the 50s. And then uh, it deals with communism. And, you know, to be honest, this movie... I actually did see it. I did see the movie. I just was too late to review it. But if you want a quick summary from me right now, I think the movie is kind of a mess. I mean, I love the Coen brothers. Um, True Grit is a great movie. Uh, I recently saw The Big Lebowski uh, like a month ago, a couple months ago. And it's a brilliant, brilliant, funny movie. But Hail Caesar is not one of their best movies, honestly. And um, the big problem with it is that it's a little too confusing. Like, it tries to jumble between different characters. Nothing feels like it gets resolved. And it kind of... For really profiling um, Scarlett Johansson and Jonah Hill, you pretty much see all their scenes in the trailer. Like, there is nothing new with those two actors that you don't see in the trailer. Like, what you see in the trailer is in the movie. Nothing else. Huh? But, I mean, it's not awful. Once again, it has really great cinematography. The actors do a really great job. Um, it does have its funny moments at points, but story-wise, it's just kind of a mess. Um, I'd say definitely check it out if you're curious. I mean, if you're a big Coen Brothers fan, chances are you've already seen it. But for me, um, there are better movies out there. Not Not a terrible one, but... Not really great either. So moving on, we have the extended edition of Ridley Scott's The Martian from last year. Now, The Martian um, obviously is based on um, the book of the same name, which I haven't read. People tell me it's really great. And it was one of my favorite movies last year, which follows astronaut Mark Watney, played by Matt Damon, who gets trapped on Mars and has to survive until he gets help. I thought it was really great, really funny, well-directed, and the thing is, this is directed by Ridley Scott, and the thing about Ridley Scott's um, director's cuts or extended editions, they tend to be much better than the theatrical version, like Blade Runner is the prime example of that. Huh? Alien, for me, it's debatable on whether or not the director's cut's better than the theatrical cut, because they both have their strengths, huh? but... Um, me personally, I feel like um, there are parts of the extended, there are parts of the theatrical cut in Alien that work better than the director's cut, but that's just me. Um, the Martian extended edition, though, um, I don't know. This is like a double dip for me. This is um, sort of like the Days of Future Past thing, where I might consider getting it. Although, unlike with Days of Future Past, I don't think. I've been told a lot about the extended cut of The Martian to really get excited for it. So, I mean, we'll see what happens. If I hear good things about it, then I might pick this one up. But if not, then I'll just stick with the theatrical version. Speaking of director's cuts, we have um, a movie that has that I didn't even know had a director's cut, which is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, uh, which many people argue to be the best Star Trek movie, even above the first J.J. Abrams movie from 2009. Um, I did not know that Wrath of Khan even had a director's cut, but, uh, I really love Star Trek Wrath of Khan, uh, might pick this up, 
um, because I actually don't own Wrath of Khan on Blu-ray. The only Star Trek movies I own, I own the J.J. Abrams movies on Blu-ray, and then I own the Star Trek trilogy on DVD. Now, if you don't know what the Star Trek trilogy is, basically it's what fans consider 2, 3, and 4 to be. So basically the first one would be Star Trek 2, Wrath of Khan. The second one would be Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock. And the third one would be Star Trek 4, The Voyage Home, which I actually reviewed on the channel. Confusing, isn't it? Huh? So, yeah, again, I've only, I only own the Star Trek trilogy on DVD, yeah? but with Wrath of Khan coming out on Blu-ray with a director's cut, then I might have to give it a shot. And it's got, like, a really cool-looking slipcover, I gotta say. Um, some reason I want to say that this is a Mondo piece? No, it's probably not, but it's definitely, it's definitely a, beautiful looking Star Trek uh, slipcover case. Um, oh yeah, everyone loves Wrath of Khan, so definitely check that out. What else do we have today? Oh, uh, two things. That, one thing I'll briefly go over, which I haven't seen, but got nominated for an Oscar for Best Animated Feature, which is Animalisa, uh, which is apparently a stop-motion movie that's more of a drama I actually haven't seen this yet, so I can't really say much on it. Uh, and then we also have Rick and Morty Season 2, which I didn't even know it just had Season 2 on Blu-ray. Because I remember, okay, uh, back when this channel was still kind of new, I actually got to see the pilot episode for Rick and Morty before it aired on Adult Swim. I liked it. Wasn't in love with it. But ever since the show aired, everyone's been falling in love with it. And I'm really say to myself... I should probably get back into this show. I mean, I want to. I just haven't found the time, but I uh, definitely want to do it because I've heard nothing but great things about Rick and Morty. Basically, pe what people describe to me is it's like Futurama. And I'm a big Futurama fan, so... And this is from Dan Harmon, so... Hey, I'm definitely down to see it uh, when I get the chance. Um, anyway, there's... There are a couple things here that are worth mentioning. There's um, 99 Homes starring Andrew Garfield and Michael Shannon. Uh, in terms of... Oh! Oh! Speaking of Star Trek, huh? going back to Star Trek, we have the complete series of Star Trek The Next Generation, which is basically the show uh, starring Patrick Stewart as Captain Picard. I saw two episodes of Next Generation. Um, so what I saw, I liked, and I've been keeping up with the fact that they've been releasing um the series on blu-ray individually by season excuse me uh i had to sneeze right there but i was just kind of waiting like you know what if i want to see next generation again i mean i remember seeing it on netflix i'm gonna check if it's still on netflix but um since i'm more of the um collect blu-ray person and not so much the streaming person i thought to myself I'll wait till the series comes out Blu-ray, like, uh, all together, before I decide to start watching it. Uh, but, um, the only problem is I don't have $208 to spend on it, like, what it's asking for on Blu-ray.com. So, that's kind of a bummer. Um, oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, hold on. Star Trek... Next Generation is on Netflix. Yes, it is on Netflix. So I don't have to worry about throwing money at it right away uh, for the Blu-ray box set. Awesome. All right, cool. So, yeah, Star Trek Next Generation right there. I mean, it's on Netflix if you're too poor to, expend, to spend the $208 for the Blu-ray box set. But it is a beautiful-looking box set, I got to say. Um, and plus, I love collecting Blu-rays. Anyway, that does it for the show, and oh my god, um, okay, let me say this, I edit these shows before I post them, but unedited, I recorded for an hour and seven minutes, by myself, huh? I think that's the longest I've ever gone with recording by myself that didn't involve a controller in my hand and a game in front of me, so... That's impressive. I don't know how long it's going to be when I cut this down, but that does it for the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, let me 
hear your thoughts on the news stories down below. And if you want to follow me, you could go to therealmrrobinson.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at realmr underscore Robinson. If you want to see what's going on with pictures and stuff, go to Instagram at the Real Mr. Robinson. You can find me on Facebook, the Real Mr. Robinson. Uh, you go to Rift.tv, uh, Real Mr. Robinson, and uh, again Patreon.com/slash the Real Mr. Robinson. If you love what I'm doing, whether it's movie reviews, let's plays, or podcasts, and you want to help donate and help the channel grow, go there. Uh, pledge any amount of money you want. If you don't, hey, that's fine. You're still getting awesome content. And also, don't forget to check out. Uh, the What I Watched Last Night podcast and tell them the real Mr. Robinson sent you. You won't regret it. So until then, oh my, I need to, I need to lie down a bit because I'm tired. So until then, um, this has been the real Mr. Robinson telling you there's only one.